Hey there, Ken. Hey, Chris, how are you? Hey, Ken, how are you doing? Hi, Kevin, long time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you think we could uh, start with had on um, being land with uh, the RG page showing? Sure. Oh boy, there we go. Ba -ba -ba. This one? Sure. Oh, you're in. You're in the member. You're logged in. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, we'll want to be able to pull down and, and show the research groups and uh, the various genomics research groups and be able to uh, talk about them. Yep. If we could. Yeah, so I think they're all listed. They're all have their own pages, right? So, yeah, yeah. And yeah. we can kind of scroll through them and and, uh, mm -hmm. and hopefully if some folks are on those research groups uh, would uh, join the, the chat, it would be great. Yep. Okay. I'm just working on some of the poll stuff. I forgot. Were you able to put these questions into a survey? I forgot. I forgot. So I'm doing it now. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, it wasn't clear to me, Kevin, how, like, I'm just looking at these first few poll questions. What the answer, you know, we're just going to have sort of discuss what the answers would be, or we don't really have choices, you know? Yeah, I think I did go back to the my what I sent you. Uh, uh -huh. I guess the like on the economic impact, I don't see any, there weren't any um, answers. Oh, I guess, yeah, I guess what we're, uh, yeah. I guess those were those were actually talking. I guess the survey questions are down there below. Uh, uh -huh. I guess possibly I see, and a lot of these were yes or no uh, answers. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it really is. It's really an, aimed at getting the uh, folks to, to start talking about the. Mm -hmm. some of the challenges that people have had sure. and I, I guess where we could show them all I, we like to be able to show all those questions at the same time Ken is that possible so go through give people the, the chance to do them all together yeah right? yeah okay do you see the poll stuff now? I don't know how the share screen works exactly. Do you see me sort of manipulating this poll question? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, that's yeah. not good. You can't see behind the curtain. That's not the way we want. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'll fix that. I'm gonna stop the share for a second. All right, let's give people a couple minutes to, to join us. All right, so now you should see the home page for research groups, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. OK. 
Okay. giving folks an opportunity to log on. Let's just do the research group and then we'll bring up the, the poll. We can see you working on the poll. We can, Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Go back to, there we go. All right. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, I wanted to, uh, begin the, uh, the, t the uh, town hall this time, talk about the research groups. Uh, I think so many of us are getting caught up with things that are happening in our labs and, uh, and just want to remind people of the research groups. Really, it's the cornerstone of the a ABRF and it pre uh, provides some uh, really some networking opportunities uh, and and I'm hoping we're going to I would like to go through the various genomics research groups and if some of those members are on the call I welcome them to uh, chat a little bit about some of the work they're doing some uh, so and but if you're feeling as though you need a uh, person to talk to uh, in your lab join a research group is it's a great way to network and a great way to stay up on, up on the science. And, and so uh, what I'd like to do is maybe go down uh, the research groups and let's, I'm gonna start with the, I see Sridhar's on, online and maybe you can talk a little bit about what the GRG has been doing. You guys got a publication that you're, uh, that you're almost ready to put in. So the genomics research group um, is actually a morphed group between the old days, there used to be a group called the nucleic acid research group, and then there was a group called the microarray research group. We, we joined both of them together and formed the genomics research group about three years ago or so. Our last project was uh, looking at, uh, just to preface what research groups typically tend to do is, you know, we're all working in core facilities and we all come across new protocols and, and new instrumentation. We want to say, hey, is this something I want to bring into the lab? But it's really not feasible unless you have a big, op big enough operation to test all the different platforms that are out there and all the different protocols. It just simply, we don't have the time or the money. And so what research groups tend to do is it's, you know, it's, it's a good consortium of people in different labs. And so different people have different instrumentations or are trying different protocols. So if you were to take an example of RNA sequencing, Okay, is there's an Illumina protocol, there's an NEB protocol, there's a BioA protocol. So people will do the different things. And, and what in the research group we try to do is we, we try to take the same sample through the different pro processes or, or different platforms, what have you. In our last study, we did this with the single cell sequencing. Single cell sequencing was becoming a really big thing you know, about four or five years ago. Uh, and Fluidime was the only one in the market. And we were like, hey, let's take a look at the single cell sequencing and see what this is all about. And what we want to do is come up with best practices at the end of the day and, and, and make things streamlined for people. So any person who's entering, entering this field now has a good guidance set that they can follow and not make the mistakes that we would have made back then. And, and so we started with the fluid amp system. Fluid amp system was a, you know, uh, was a, um, 400 cell chip, IFC chip, and we, we compared that with bulk RNA sequencing. And in, in that study, what we did is we took a breast cancer cell line, we treated it with the histone DSLNs inhibitor, and we knew that by treating it with the HDAC, there are going to be changes in, in, in transcriptome, in the transcriptome. And we want to see, can we compare those two, looking at the single cells and see if that, how that compares to the traditional bulk RNA seq that most people do. While we're doing this stuff, you know, we came across different challenges as to, well, the IFC, the, the fluidime system was in Boston, the cells were being grown in Albany, so there's shipping involved, and so things were not viable once they reached there. 
so these are things that we, we, we put into, you know, we took notes and say, okay, if you were to design an experiment, what are the things that you need to pay attention to? The other thing was the IFC chip was, you know, one sample at a time. And so by the time you process your stuff and you put it on an IFC chip, you got one set of data and then you're doing the next set of data the next day. So if you were to compare control and treat it, well, they're not happening on the same day. So that guidance actually helped Fluidime in coming up with an 800 FC chip, uh, cell chip, so you can put two samples at a time. Meanwhile, uh, Wafergen came out with their single cell system. Uh, and as, as the study went on, I mean, there are other platforms that came in, like the 10X Genomics, the BioRat. And so depending on our membership, and we had access to these different tools, so we took the same uh, samples and, and put them on different uh, platforms. And finally, that, that study, you know, we finished the study last year, presented it, but it took almost a year or longer to actually put it into print. Uh, so it's available in bioarchive right now as we speak and we, we submit it to Nature. Um, hopefully it should be coming out soon. Um, so that, that was what the GRG did in, in the past. This year we're thinking about moving into spatial transcriptomics because that is another growing area. Um, where people are getting into spatial transcriptomics, so you're doing single cell and imaging and, and combining both volumes of data together, so you know exactly where that cell came from in the context of the of the tissue or the the uh, um, sample. So initially, when we started doing this, well, COVID hit, and so things took a, a, a backstage, and and we were in the process of thinking, okay, maybe we can get some access to some COVID samples to do these things. And that also has challenges because if you were to deal with those samples, you need a BSL-3 lab or this, uh, you know, certain precautions would have to be taken more so than others. It's not quite feasible yet. So right now we are in the process of taking uh, mouse tissue um, you know, and compare them on different platforms. Uh, the this, this, this study hasn't started yet, so if people are interested, um, I would say send me an email or send an email to Natalia or um, um, geez, I'm blanking now. <laughs> Catherine? Catherine, thank you. <laughs> She's going to kill me. <laughs> she uh, will. <laughs> she should. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, shoot us an email. Our, our email addresses are available on the website um, because we would love for members who have access to tools and want to actually help design uh, best practices to, to take part in this study and, uh, in, 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 in the, the single cell study was over two or three years and there were lots of challenges that it posed in the duration and we've learned from those things and we wanna make sure that the same mistakes don't apply to when we do this new study or, uh, and we can get it, get it done quicker, shorter, sweeter in, in, in a much defined uh, time frame. Um, so feel free to contact us. Um, we're always looking for new members. We meet once a month. Um, so it's not a lot of uh, Zoom meetings because I know we are all overloaded with Zoom meetings. Um, that's it for the GRG. Great. Right. Thank you, Sriyar. Let's just go to the, is anyone here on, let's go to the GERG, Genome Editing Research Group. Is anyone on the call from the Genome Editing Research Group? So this is a, a group that's that's been act it's been small but mighty. It's been active, and uh, I know the one of the co-chairs, uh, Maureen, has just left, and but Elizabeth uh, Sergison from Dartmouth is really looking for new uh, new members. So there, you can scroll down, Sri uh, Ken. Uh, you can you can stop there. Their last study, which they presented at the uh, Palm Springs meeting, the reproducibility of uh, indel formation rates by comparing guide RNA format and delivery method. They, they're halfway through that project. And if you're doing a lot of gene editing, they're looking for more sites and uh, groups to uh, participating uh, in that study. So uh, contact Elizabeth Sergison if you're interested in joining it and being part of the genome editing research group. Uh, and so let's go down to the uh, the next one, the MMRG. Hey, Kevin. How's it going? Good. 
thanks to Ken, I, I found my way in into the ABRF cave. <laughs> Quite the exclusive club. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so a quick update. So I have to tell you right now, um, most of the members of MMRG, their labs are buried in COVID. Um, so I co-chair right now with Robbie. Um, Robbie's lab is buried with COVID testing. And of course, my lab is buried in COVID testing. So we're kind of in a holding pattern right now. Um, it doesn't by any means um, mean that we're, we're like disappearing um, by any means. In fact, one of the, one of the methods we were thinking about doing is we have a new COVID method that Streeter is pretty familiar with. And, and we're thinking about kicking it into an MMRG research study where we actually do um, try to discriminate links of RNA of COVID from environmental surveillance using LAMP and RT-QPCR. So this is one study that we've kind of talked about on our GLAMP call. Some of you are probably familiar with the global LAMP uh, community. Um, we just haven't formulated it yet. Um, right now, if I remember right, we have 13 people um, that are on the MMRG, uh, the website, needs to be updated and where was that at? i know you guys were working on that a little bit kevin um updating the website but i think that went on hold for a bit yeah we started to go to the the front page of this and with the abrf no the front page of the research groups oh okay mm -hmm. we started uh, we started working on it. it it's behind yeah 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 like, like a lot of things are, are behind not because we're lazy it's just that yeah, like it's changed a, a little bit temporarily here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it because they've got that central glamp as well, and they're trying to develop standards, right? Is that uh, and be able to uh, get a nice resource for all those the assays that are COVID-based assays. Which, what are you talking? You're not talking about the glamp community. That's yes, the, the central glamp. Is that kind of the offshoot of, uh, of oh, you're the one that Kevin's putting together? Yeah. Specific Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So this is entirely different, mm -hmm. uh, but it is out of the realm of, of metagenomics and microbiome analysis. So I, mm -hmm. I have to tell you, I've been kind of out of it with just because I've been, uh, so wrapped up with COVID testing, um, and I did write a note to Ravi, just to give you and, and, and Ken an update. I did write a note to Ravi, who's my co-chair, and uh, he was going to join, but he won't be able to because he's actually in the lab right now, and we're going to kind of talk about it. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I know what you're saying is uh, we don't want to lose our, our, our mojo here, but um, our mojo is shifting maybe for one year to, to COVID, and we can present some cool covid stuff and we're doing a little covid study and Shridhar is familiar with that um and we got all of our reagents in but i just haven't formulated it and even talked to the group about it so we haven't had an mmrg call yet since covid shutdown um and we're going to have our first extreme microbiome call on october 27th and after that we're probably going to resume the mmrg studies in november that's the that's my closest update right now. And some of you that are on Extreme Microbiome will get the email on our resuming our our yearly schedule, our our monthly schedule, um, and and MMRG will come after that. Yeah, but you're still open for to have people join your uh, group. Right? Oh, desperately we want people to join. Yeah, people that that think outside the box and it, and we're willing to do anything that's microbiome or metagenomics oriented. And we do want more people. We have, I think 12 now, but some of them are legacy. Okay. So right. they're rotating. All right. Okay. I think the uh, DSRG is next. All right, I think I'm the only DSRG member here, so I can give this update. Um, so much like the great description that Sridhar gave, um, the DSRG is really focused on reproducibility um, and rigor within sort of more of the wet lab aspects of uh, NGS sequencing. So 
looking at quality of material that is going into library preps, um, looking at different types of library preparation to see which ones give us the most consistency, sort of upstream of putting it on to any technology. So um, we have two current research projects. Um, one of them is looking at capture RNA. Uh, that project is in the analysis phase. Um, so we are especially interested in anybody who would like to get their feet wet on a little bit of more of the informatics end of things. Um, and then we also have a second project that it's a, a basically a three to four year longitudinal project um, where we're attempting to make some different FFPE standards and then run those standards through sort of the upstream pipeline before it goes on to sequencing. So looking at different extraction techniques, looking at different uh, quality metrics, looking at different library preps to see what works best for these really complicated types of samples. And then also to hopefully give a repository of FFPE samples to the community that can sort of emulate a, uh, a formalin fixed, really degraded sample in a way that's better than what's kind of available on the market right now. Because usually now we just have people that degrade intact RNA or use a random block out of their freezer where they have absolutely no idea what's been got done to it before that point. Um, so that study is in year two. We've done most of the collection, um, but now we're working on sort of all of those downstream parts of the process. Um, so we are very interested in anybody who would be interested in helping at any point there. So the QC, the um, library prep, anything like that. Uh, as everybody else has said, of course, we are looking for new members. We would love new members. Uh, there's 12 members on the, the uh, group right now, and everybody is really pretty active, which is great. Um, calls tend to be every two weeks on Zoom. Um, we don't expect everybody to make every call, um, but that tends to work really well for keeping us on task. And um, Yes, you can either contact myself um, as the EV liaison. Otherwise, Jessica and Zach are the two co-chairs. Um, so you can contact them as well. Thank you, Marie. And then I guess it should, we need to get the GBERG. We probably should have led with the GBERG because good informatics is, is a good place to work. It's a good experiment starts. Is any, anyone here from GBERG? Volunteering yeah. to do it. Yeah, you're, you're recruiting me. Um, so the GBERG is is also always looking for new folks, uh, just like everybody else. Um, the, the COVID crisis caused every single lab out there to discover how much old data hadn't been fully an analyzed uh, and ask every core facility out there to spend all of their time analyzing data that was probably left behind for a reason, generally. Um, so we've been playing heroics. Um, the current study that we're trying to wrap up has been comparing different ontology tools. Uh, this uh, is uh, Julie Dragon, I should say, is the chair. I'm, I'm pseudo co-chair right now. I wish I was more of an active co-chair. I'm less of an active co-chair because I feel the responsibilities. Um, but uh, Charlie Whitaker uh, at the Coke is taking the point on this, uh, trying to get this written up. Um, just looking at but how the free tools versus the paid tools um, work. Uh, is it really worth $50,000 a year for a license to some of these things? And sometimes the answer is yes, and it really depends on the question you're asking. Um, but helping understand what types of questions it makes sense to go to these more expensive tools versus ones where it doesn't. Uh, and so that's kind of an ongoing study. Hopefully we'll be wrapping up soon. When we'd like to start, um, I don't know if we yet to start, again, for the above reasons, uh, is looking at long read RNA-seq and compared to looking at how, uh, what we can learn from that relative to annotations uh, for uh, particularly three prime single cell style methods. Um, a lot of this, you know, a lot of these ideas come out of anecdotes, uh, if you will, which is um, if we, if you look at stack data from your RNA-seq from your single cells. How often do you find that those stacks just miss the gene? And you, you know, a gene that should be there is just not there. And you go and you look and it's because the, the, the traits, the, the reads just aren't quite at the three prime end that they have the wrong annotations. Um, and that's fine when you've got full body, but less useful when the three prime digital or something like that. 
like single cell, like lithium. Um, and the question partly, you know, and, and certainly preliminary work we've done, we've seen um, big differences of the lengths of transcripts detected using something like an Oxford nanopore or a bio that may end up being informative uh, to help back with the Illumina and how often, just basic questions, how often is this happening? What are the types of signatures of this happening? Um, and kind of more of a basic question, we start using long read really for RNA-seq to where that may give us different types of information than short read. Um, so those are some of the types of questions we'd like to move towards if we ever get out from under uh, the pile of stuff that is over us right now. But we're always looking for new people as well. All right. Okay. And I guess last but not least is the NGS uh, group. Yeah, so I can give you an update on that. Thanks, Kevin. So um, I think that everybody uh, knows that we've been working on the final manuscript uh, for the DNA sequencing phase two paper. I, I don't know if, um, let me just look at the agenda to see who's here, if Jonathan is here. Um, he's not on, okay. So um, last month we submitted the final paper to uh, Nature Biotechnology again. Um, uh, so it is completed with all the sequencing platforms that we presented on in the past. So it's in the hands of Nature Biotechnology and they are in a really weird spot because their turnaround time for even, even doing reviews is like 90 days right now. So we're just waiting to hear back on our reviews of that, that document. And after that, we'll probably go through five or 10 edits and then it'll be in print. So, but it has been uploaded um, uh, to uh, bioarchives. So the, the temporary doc is in bioarchives, but we're just waiting for the peer review. And that wraps up our phase two uh, actual study. And whether we continue NGS group, uh, we'll, we'll discuss over, over the next few months. We talked about a phase three, but I, I don't know if that's gonna happen right now with, with people's time being so short, but papers, hopefully going to come out in the next four months at the speed that that nature biotech is running right now well i think that takes care of all the uh genomics groups and bioinformatics genomics groups so maybe we can move on with the the agenda does anybody uh, have any comments or questions they want to ask any of the uh rg groups uh yeah i have a question Sure. So I think there's a, a false sense that, um, you know, the RGs are always looking for director level members. Can you comment on that? Because, I mean, when I tell my group to join, they're like, oh, but we're not a director, you know. Oh. And, but they know, they know more than I do, right? So, oh. so, so let me jump in. Yeah. There might be directors and there are people who are not directors, but we all know who actually knows how to do the real work. Right. Who knows more about the protocols. And so, you know, it, this is really about people who know what to do to help other people who are trying to learn how, what to do. So titles don't matter, degrees don't matter. It's your experience that matters, right? And even if you don't have the experience, but you're willing to learn and you're willing to put some extra, because we're all volunteers, put that extra time in to make sure a study is completed, Anybody is welcome. Right. It's an interesting point you bring up though, Anoja, because we were just talking about this a couple of days ago in the lab and, and, and one of the people in my lab were like, oh, well, I did all the work for my director and then the director is the one that went to ABRF and presented it. So mm -hmm. how do we ratchet it down to, to the people in the lab to make them feel like they're invited? And you know, I think that's what you're asking, right? How do we do that? Uh, and, and honestly, that's part of what these travel awards were hoping to help do is bring some some folks that maybe wouldn't have the funds to to come to these meetings. But and so now I think it was one of the original concept for these scholarships and travel awards is to help lab members that may that may want to be come to the meeting to get them there. So and there was also the impetus for starting the local regional chapters. Mm -hmm. Because not everybody would have the funds, director or not, to go to yeah. a national meeting far away with airfare and hotel 
but you can certainly take your staff to the next state or your own, uh, you know, to a university in your own, much easier than across the country. So that was one of the uh, goals of starting the regional chapters with NERDS and MADCOW and um, all the other ones. Yeah. I would say it's, it's very much, I would, if it's a technician who wants to learn and wants to grow and wants to become, to, to, to further their career, it's a great way to do it. Yeah. To become part of the RG. And if you're actually part of the RG, not just I did the experiments for the RG, it's a lot easier to make the justification to your boss that you should be going to the meeting. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not going to be the RG that's turning you away. Well, and, and, and honestly, the uh, Ron Nice, he sees that and he's put up his own, his own money and he has a, a scholarship for a not a director, but someone in the lab to send them to the meeting. So th this is, we, we want the folks on the front line because we learn a lot from the people. Yeah, that so I would say when you're asking for um, uh, people to join, maybe make that clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All comers. <laughs> yeah. All right. And plenty of people give their first scientific talk in their lives. Is <laughs> there an RG talk at the other end? Yeah. Well, I remember back in Memphis, uh, Scott and I had that. Uh, he was working in uh, Tim's lab. <laughs> Very good. Uh, any more questions about RGs? Uh, kind of want to move a little bit on to uh, some of the pain that some of us might be feeling in, in our in our operations due to the uh, COVID. And maybe, uh, Ken, you can bring up these questions. These are, these are survey questions, mostly gonna be yes, no, but uh, they're more talking points than gathering information. And, and these are the kind of the points I'd like to talk to folks about. Can you bring those up? One, just one second, Kevin, just finalizing uh, one thing. Yeah. Sorry about that. So the, the questions for about the uh, economic impact of your core operation, and then we also have talking about workforce as well. Uh, that would be a, a separate thing, but I'm... Just sorry about that. I thought I had these So while well, Ken is putting yep. that stuff up, uh, let me go back to the RGs. You know, we, the ABRF is made of members who are in academia industry. You know, so people are vendors, people who are consumers. Uh, of the platform technology. So, you know, for, I know there are a lot of vendors on this call too, you know, people in the, in the lab, scientists from the vendor groups or even marketing people. The RGs would love to get some ideas as to what do you want to know? Because at the end of the day, we want to create a study that has got maximum input for everybody. The people who, who you know, for the people who are making the tools, what tools do we need? What better, you know, like the example I gave you with the fluidine. The 400 chip had some flaws. Well, it wasn't doing what we needed to do. That helped them make this 800 chip. So we can help each other. Uh, and so that did be, and I would love for us to have, communicate more. Uh, and if you don't know who, just write to the chair of the RG, say, hey, you know, we were thinking of doing something like this. Do you have any suggestions? Or, or do, uh, can you think about, can you help us design a study for doing X, Y, Z? Uh, I'd love to have more of those collaborations. Mm -hmm. Well, Kevin, unfortunately, we've hit a technical glitch, and we won't be able to do these poll, the poll questions uh, through Zoom, but perhaps we can do them verbally. Well, uh, and folks can do show of hands. And we can do that on, you can do well, that. Sure. So I'm just going to yeah. bring up, I mean, rather than do the uh, survey, um, I think I'm what I'm going to kind of read some of these out loud, and, and maybe we can, well, so it has your... Has the pandemic required major changes in what services uh, that you're providing? Have you had to change your menu, if you will? And or, uh, and I, I guess if you, uh, thumbs up or a thumbs, uh, I guess would be a way to, to, to do this. Uh, and see if you've had, had any, uh, any, any comments on uh, whether it's been no change or have you just 
or have you decided that I can't offer all the all my menu at this point and just trying to get a What about adding more to your menu? Well, there you go. Have you increased your menu? Yeah. <laughs> it's been, so I'm seeing some neutral, I'm seeing uh, anyway. So yeah, uh, I guess any feedback on, uh, on what, what the, uh, those who've, who've had to reduce their menu, uh, uh, what they've, why they've had to reduce it. Yeah. So uh, I'll tell you my experience from uh, here at, at, at Albany. Um, when the pandemic first hit, I mean, people were and then the campuses were shut down. Uh, most of the labs were all vacant. So we, you know, we would typically expect samples for sequencing and qPCR and microarray and whatnot. And there was nobody to submit the samples. People who had samples in the lab sent their samples and went home to work from home. Um, so that steady flow of samples was not there, other than people who were actually working on COVID. Uh, since we were working on COVID, we were considered essential, so there was no working from home for us. Um, and, but it was still, samples were still trickling in, and not at the frequency that we were used to. As things change and, and campuses were slowly opening up, people came back and now there are more samples coming in, uh, more grants being written. So work productive has, has increased. But as Scott mentioned, meanwhile, we were, you know, we were not just doing what we were doing, but we were retooling ourselves to do uh, LAMP assays and QPCR assays. And, and recently we've been starting to do wastewater surveillance. So all these new things that we would have never thought about doing, we are doing now. And those samples that we used to be doing are pouring in. So now it's really swamped, you know, we're really swamped. So it's, it's been a, I wish the curve would flatten. It's, it's, it's <laughs> a rising peak. Yeah. So I guess you kind of touched on that, Sridhar, and I, and I guess the, uh, how, how have your volumes changed with all your services? And so they, have they shifted or how, how is that? And you kind of addressed that, and I'd be kind of curious to know. There are lots of different things that come in at the same time. So it's like, even if the volumes are low, it's, it's they're like apples and oranges. So it's like, what do we do first? Yeah. I, I, speaking from my, my core, the... Uh, our services are all, we haven't changed our menu, but the level of, of uh, input has been lower. While people are coming back to the lab, they're in their research labs right now. But I will say that only about half the PIs are coming into the office. And uh, while the cat's away, the mice will play. And I don't think the work is, is being done as the same level as it was prior to COVID because the, PIs aren't really are there writing. That's just my perception. So people are, or grad students are coming in and leaving as soon as they got their experiment done and not really doing anything else. Anyone else seeing anything like that? I have a lot of PIs complaining about that to me that their um, that their staff is just not, or their students or whatever are just not doing. Um, what they expect them to do and they can't go in to supervise. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, uh, and then there's the social distancing. You can't get as many people in a space as you could previously either. I have to agree with um, um, Sridhar. So once all these labs uh, closed down and they went to rotational hours, what they're doing is just dumping everything on the core. So our entire staff is here regular hours since, you know, I think it was June 1st. So people are dumping off like 95 RNAs to be extracted. They used to extract them themselves. And what's happening is they're getting lazy and they're saying, Oh, the core is open. So they send them here. So everything remain is now coming here. And it's just like, we're just like, the last thing you want to do is waste any of your time extracting somebody's RNA, but it's a service. And now we've got people asking us to extract 200 RNAs, and it's like, oh, we don't want to do this. This is like no fun. But it's, it's really a headache because 
I'm, I'm like sending out notes saying that our turnaround time is now doubled because there's so much stuff coming in. So lucky for them, they got a place to drop it off to, I suppose. So have any of your, uh, so your turnaround times are longer and others are dropped. And yeah, they're longer. And I'm just wondering, is it okay to just charge more, you know, price gouging? Is that okay? So we can buy our next machine? <laughs> that is not allowed, Scott. We can call it a <laughs> pandemic surcharge. <laughs> yeah. Can't store up money to buy instruments. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yeah. No, well, on the other hand, the other thing that has happened is that lunch. You know, the other thing that has happened is the, the disposables, the plastics are in short supply. And so, you know, you can have samples, but if you don't have pipette tips, there's nothing much you can do. And, and that's caused some delays too, where some projects have to wait because you need some things for those versus others. Yeah, our NGS lab is uh, desperately in search of pipette tips for our robots. Yeah. They're back ordered to like February. Yeah, we have... I have four liquid handling systems and getting consumables for those is a, is a hard, it's really difficult. I guess you need to work from home on the golf course then, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just got word from our purchasing that there's gonna be a plastic shortage and Fisher says to stock up on tips now. <laughs> What's up? make that come true right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well it's, it's just about the troughs the uh plates just about every the pipettes just about everything for the liquid handling systems just have been difficult well, to acquire. and we at the beginning donated so many of our tips when we were closed down for mm -hmm. testing purposes through the state that it was hard to get started back up again So Kevin, I don't know if, if late is better than never, but we have some, we have the poll questions ready. If uh, you've addressed some of them orally, but uh, if you want to run that, should we run that? Uh, I guess, should we just go to the, the next section though? The, you have the ones for section three? They're all together. Okay, let's just put them up then and cool. can spend a few minutes. And folks can skip what they don't want to, what they've already okay. discussed uh, during the call. And again, scroll down, you got a, a set of 10 questions. So there's juicy ones at the end. Maybe that last one should have been hours per month because you know greater than 40 hours a week on zoom yeah that'd be that'd be that's hard <laughs> i'm sure some of us could do it but yeah got day jobs i i feel like it's greater than 40 hours a week so that's why <laughs> that's for sure and wish it was a lot less yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the submit button doesn't seem to click. Oh. Okay. Good. It's rolling in now. Good point, Amber Scott. I agree. <laughs> Can't adjust my prices. <laughs> All right, we'll give folks another f five seconds or so on those last questions. And we're gonna close in three, two, one, end, share. Yeah. Yay. Okay. So it doesn't look like as many of uh, had some major changes in the, their course. I think it was kind of discussed before. Uh, new services, not really. Uh, reduce the menu, no. 
Okay. Let's keep. Uh, compare with pre-COVID, so it looks like most of us are lower. Uh -huh. uh, sending samples off-site. I've actually, I've been seeing things like Sanger and, and some stuff like that uh, went off-site and I'm not sure it's going to come back. We'll see how that goes. I don't know if anybody else is, but it doesn't look like many people are seeing uh, stuff getting set off site, which is great. Uh, the workforce looks like many of them are doing altered schedules. Uh, we're doing furloughs. We've had some terminations. Oh, I see. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then people that are leaving because they don't want to be in the lab cannot be refilled. And uh, we've had to do pay cuts. I see. Wow. Has there been any inf inference about whether those would be temporary? Uh, the furloughs are just a, where we, everyone has to take two weeks, no pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the pay cuts? And the pay cuts are uh, for one year, this year. Okay. It's either pay cuts or so no pay. Yeah. Where are you getting that information, Kevin? Because that wasn't in your survey, right? Well, that's, what I, that's what's going on with me. But if you scroll down. Oh, oh, oh. You can scroll down, you can see what the responses were uh, on number six. Right, seven out of 24 with pay cuts. Yeah. Oh, I'd be curious to know if people are technicians, directors, um, um, stuff like that, and what level of pay cuts they had to take. I talked to um, Rich about that before. Uh, we had to take 5% pay cuts here, um, but and they're permanent for staff, but faculty, um, some of them agreed to the pay cuts for one year and the other group said we don't want pay cuts so the uh, staff really really got the short end of the stick up in vermont i don't know if that happened in other places but so at star wars um everyone had to take a four percent pay cut um and we had about um 40 some employees who went on furlough but they have all been brought back oh. the four percent pay cut um we are hoping it will only be till the end of this year, but we haven't heard anything uh, specific about that yet. Um, Ken, uh, Kev, you mentioned um, you had people send their samples out and you're not sure if they'll come back yeah. uh, for Sanger sequencing. We actually had to do the same because um, as our institute did something uh, in a very different way than most institutes. They opened the PI labs first and told all the core members to stay home. As soon as the PI labs opened, they wanted our services. And one of the first things they asked for was Sanger sequencing. So we started sending it out, um, but the labs were in charge of sending it out. But they didn't really like that. They wanted us to start it back up. And we have done that uh, in a limited capacity. And we also started next gen uh, middle of last month, and we are offering all the services. and. I mean, we have so many projects coming in. I don't know if these people just stayed home and thought about NGS projects, but we are busy right now. Yeah. Uh, but we have really had to um, focus on how we are going to do certain applications safely. For instance, any single cell pro projects or spatial transcriptomics projects where there's a lot of collaboration, where we interact with the lab members more. We had to um, really focus on that. No, I, I'm, we're in the same boat, and I, and I wanted to bring this up is if you have to be sending stuff out because you've reduced your menu, there's a group of us here that may be able to help you out. So, uh, there, so uh, I'm sure many of us offer these uh, services and that uh, we, we know each other and this uh, kind of help each other out. So keep this in mind if you're uh, needing to uh, send some services out kind of look at who's on this call today. Sure. Yeah. I totally agree. Do not send your samples to Novagen. Send them to Kevin. <laughs> somebody on this call, but please don't ever send your samples to Novagen. I sent my sample, my Sanger samples to Derek, and yeah. he was so great. Every, all the PIs loved working with him. Yeah. Not as much as they love working with me, but, you know. <laughs> of course not. 
<laughs> so it looks like students uh, access is kind of split right down the middle. Yeah. Uh, now they're, when the students came back, so did the, the percent of COVID in our community. So they're, they kind of went hand in hand. Well, Scott's standing on his head, but there you go. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, and so the, now that w that may change now that uh, our numbers are are getting back down, but they didn't want anything to do with the students bringing them into the labs with them. Because so they, we actually, I had a hard time answering this question because our grad students are allowed in the lab, but no undergrad students. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not sure if that's saving things or not, but uh, apparently they trust the grad students just a little bit better. Yeah, no. So my, we've had grad I, students in from the beginning and have had zero outbreaks. Yeah. And then we brought students back to campus and the research labs have still been like totally fine. Um, but only those people who are doing like real research in the labs rather than just like free internships have been allowed back. Um, but obviously they shut down. I'm at CU Boulder. Um, they shut down in-person classes and stuff for a week yeah. or a couple weeks. Yeah, the grad students have uh, mostly been good, except for one group that came from where the COVID outbreak came from. She was from that and she brought it back to the lab. Uh, but the, uh, the ones that actually have had the problems have been the med students. They, they, they're very gregarious and uh, there's a, quite a few that missed the first week of classes because of, oh. So, in a way, but, all right, um, before we, we got about 10 minutes left, uh, if, if anyone wants to bring anything up about this, but do you have some updates, Sridhar, on the surveillance, COVID surveillance? Survey? Yeah, the survey. I haven't seen any new results since the last time we talked about it. Okay. So. I think we should, we should probably resend that survey because more people might be interested uh, or, or might have started. Uh -huh. Like last time we weren't doing any wastewater, but now we're like <laughs> in the middle of it. Okay. Uh, all right. And I guess we're, it's unfortunate uh, Stuart left us because one of the questions I'm trying to get a sense of is, uh, these online meetings, I think we're all trying to get in, and I was a little facetious on the number of hours that people are spending on it, but I think I'm here talking to so many of us that are getting burnt out on these online meetings. And really what I was hoping to get from the, the end of this is, what do you think is a reasonable session for a workshop or a reasonable set, uh, time for the, an online meeting or an event, one hour, two hours. I probably should have asked it in that way, but um, I think many of us are spending so much time at our own institutions uh, with these Zoom calls or webinars, and then all the companies are sending them out at the same time. Uh, but every day of the week, my schedule from about 11 to two or three in the afternoon is filled with some webinar because that seems to be the popular time. Uh, so I, I would open the idea because we're trying to get some of the uh, uh, educational events year long and we want to be able to come up with a workflow that really fits with your schedule that it's not going to be obtrusive uh, and, and it would welcome any things that have, you've visited or you've been part of that you found oh, that that wasn't so bad. I, I can I can do that one again. So are you thinking about um, say for ABRF if you guys do virtual this year, doing an hour and a half a day for a week, or or cutting the fluff out, or I know that's what what Stuart and his team did for nerd meeting. It's going to be two hours a day for two, three days. So right. that's that's barely tolerable, but. Um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I am so burned out on Zoom calls. I, I'm like deleting them all as fast as they're coming in my inbox. So, but there's some that I do want to uh, take part in, but certainly not for three hours a day. Um, 
those are rough. So is it every day or every other day better? I mean, I'm just trying to get a, put it all at once or spread it out every other day for a, let's say a workshop. You, you know, you've been, you've given workshops, Scott, and, and, uh, and if you had a, uh, a four hour workshop would that four hours in one day or two hours on Tuesday, well, two hours on Thursday? That's a very good question. And so I was doing a session uh, to be asked to do the COVID session for nerds. And I said, you know, what? I'm just gonna do uh, a lightning round, 12 minutes per person. And if you can't get your slides out in 12 minutes, I mean, I think the reason I said that is because we're all, I, I just get tired of sitting. And if people, if you give them a half an hour, they'll talk for a half an hour. So I know Mason's on my speaking um, schedule. So I know he can do it in 12 minutes and there's other people that are gonna do it. So I just, I'd rather have it shrunk down, but you know, I, I can't, I think I can do 90 minutes a day if I needed to for three days, but it does get really tough because, for example, right now, maybe it's different for me. My lab is buried in samples. So it's like, if I'm away from the lab, even like now, it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is anybody else going to these 10, like I signed up for the 10X user group meeting. It's eight days for like five hours a day. It is absolutely insane. Um, and I think that that is a, bad thing because I'm just going to get so burned out. I'm not going to bother logging in, but we're getting, you know, the Chromium. So it's like, I really want to get involved in this. Um, but I really have enjoyed like two or three hour sessions a couple days a week at, at most. Yeah, I'm with Amber. I was trying to do the 10X talks yesterday. There were so many technical issues too. And then committing all that time when we are trying to get our labs back up and running was very tough. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing that I like is, uh, even if you have, let's say, you know, four hour long session of talks, if you have recordings of it, I don't have to be there for four hours. I can come and attend that one hour block that I'm interested in. And hey, I missed that one. Do I have, can I go back and look at the rec recording? That's what I liked with some of the AGPT uh, sessions. Because simply there isn't, there's not enough time or even brain cells to digest all that information. And that is the plan for the ABRF virtual annual meeting as described behind me. Um, we will, the, the content will be presented essentially from noon Eastern to probably about five o'clock on the bulk of four days. Um, and, but it, as Sridhar suggested, it will all be recorded. It will all be available shortly after um, for all participants. Uh, and registration for the meeting will open very soon. Stuart and his team are putting the pieces together for the, the bulk of the program. The anchor keynote speakers have already been identified and scheduled. So we will start Sunday afternoon uh, in a typical fashion with the first keynote uh, and then run through, again, each of these sort of half days uh, through Thursday uh, and another keynote actually on Wednesday afternoon per, based on his schedule. So we're trying to find that balance between, we know there's too much screen time, but as, and as Sridhar suggested, they will be uh, recorded and available to you and you can jump in and out. Any other topics people want to bring up? It's uh, getting quote to the top of the hour, and I don't want to keep everyone in a, in a Zoom meeting longer than they want to be. So Kev, there's a single cell uh, workshop coming up here soon, right? Right. Yes. So that's, uh, you want to talk about that one, Ken? We got that, and then we've got, and we, we can kind of talk offline and know you about yours. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so the ABRF Education Committee will be tr um, presenting a year-long series instead of the satellite workshops concentrated on the first day of the annual meeting. The first of those is, as Kevin and Nojum mentioned, uh, coming up October 20th and 22nd. Uh, it'll be a two-part program on single-cell omics. Uh, presented by a panel of, I believe it's six faculty members. Um, so for two hours uh, on, I believe it's a Tuesday, Thursday format. So you can break up, uh, break up the day and break up the content. Um, details and registration for that are available on the ABRF website. Uh, and then again, that's the first of what will be a year long approach to delivering the education workshops uh, starting here in 2020 and then continuing through 2021. 
And uh, Kate Hall and I are hoping to do a special transcriptomics um, series starting end of October. So if um, anybody's doing special transcriptomics work in your groups, please reach out to me. Hopefully we can have you uh, present as well. And then the next session will be the business skills workshop. We'll be, again, a perennial, very popular topic and session at the ABRF annual meeting. Um, Bill Hendrickson and his faculty will be presenting that again in a Tuesday, Thursday, moderated format for two weeks. So a total of four sessions, each of which will be two hours. Again, replicating the, the amount of content you'd receive in a face-to-face -face environment, um, breaking it up, having that interaction and exercises. Uh, the first session there will be the first week in November, uh, excuse me, second week in November, starting on the 10th. Uh, details for that program will be online uh, tomorrow or the next day. So watch for that. And if there are burning things that you feel ABRF should be doing, let us know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, we just, so if there's things, topics that you want us to bring up in, in, at these uh, genomics town halls or any of the town halls, please let us know. We're pleased to uh, bring that up. And or challenges that you're facing, you know, whether yeah, it's yeah. access yeah. to resources, access to better training materials, um, different ways to collaborate. How can we help solve any of the problems or issues you might be facing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But just to plug in for next week, next week is the, the NERGE meeting. So that runs from Tuesday through Friday, two hours. Nine to 10 is the keynote and 10 to 11 is a, is a breakout session. Uh, there are multiple breakout sessions every day and so you can choose which one you want to attend. Um, it's free, it's virtual. Add it to your Zoom list and please register. Let's go to nullskit.abrf.org. Yeah. I'll, I'll put, put it on the chat here. If you haven't already registered, please go ahead and register. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. Did he, did he, is it up there? Okay. Give yep, people there time now. before mm -hmm. we uh, end or anything. So very good. Well, it's actually great to see so many of you uh, here today and, and, and hope everyone's uh, staying safe and doing well. And uh, I guess about when's the, we have one in the first week of November as well. What day is that one? I believe it's the second. Is that election day? No, the day before. Okay. All right. I don't know why I thought it was on election day, but. Oh, actually, you're right. You're right. It is pre-scheduled for Tuesdays. So I guess we should move that <laughs> in, case, in case the folks have other plans. Yeah, so, you know, we may have to jump that around because I don't think we want to com compete with the, uh, w with any other events. So we'll, we'll stay tuned for when that next no, one. This is more, more interesting than the election. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wonderful seeing you all. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.